Women may hold up half of the sky and women have always been instrumental in technology development. There are quite some successful women who have founded their own technology businesses including Jesse Jennett, Tina Sharkey, Amy Chang and Emily Voice. Women remain the minority in technology and data science, but it's not necessarily a push to bring more in. Rather, it's a movement to bring awareness to the current situation, highlight the growth opportunities available and bring the benefits of gender diversity to light. Women bring a lot to the technology table just as they always have. But having the support and being recognized for what they bring will continue to close the gap at a slow and steady pace. Every day is a great day to celebrate the amazing women in your life, but International Women's Day gives you an extra reason to do just that. On the occasion of International Women's Day today, here's wishing all women a happy Women's Day. Let's all think critically about our thoughts and actions and how we can better promote gender inequality and celebrate women's achievement. A very warm welcome on our podcast for our listeners. This is Priya Dialani, Senior Editor at Analytics Insight and your host for today. In our last Last podcast, um, Adam told us about how important data analysis is, and without the expertise of professionals who turn cutting-edge technology into actionable insights, big data is nothing. It is becoming clear by the day that there is enormous value in data processing and analysis, and that is where a data scientist steps into the spotlight. Today, more and more organizations are opening up their doors to big data and unlocking its power, increasing the value of a data scientist who knows how to tease actionable insights out of gigabytes of data. We are still confronting a worldwide emergency. Quick and accurate data analytics that can pinpoint outbreaks and anticipate movement is critical to fighting the irresistible infection. Data science can play an important role in breaking down a large-scale testing of individuals by connecting these outcomes with the anonymized health attributes of hospitalized patients. Nonetheless, how would the role of a data scientist evolve in the post-COVID world? With us, we have Mr. Ira Cohen, co-founder and chief data scientist at Anadot. Hi, Ira. How are you doing? Very good. Uh, pleasure to be here. Great, Ira. So um, right now we're going to talk more about the growing importance of data scientists and how the role is going to evolve. So to kickstart and know more about it, um, can you tell us, our users, about uh, what Anadot is, its specialization and the services it offers? Yes, uh, my pleasure. So, uh, Anadot is a company that uh, uh, we founded uh, six and a half years ago with the mission of changing how monitoring works today in the world, uh, in the world of business. Uh, so, monitoring, uh, monitoring how the business behaves has been and, and still for, for many companies is a, ta- a, ma- a very manual task of looking at dashboards, looking at reports, uh, weeding through data and trying to find a view that tells you something is happening in the business that's impacting either revenue, customer experience, uh, or partnership relationships. And we came to change that with machine learning uh, by saying, well, we have all this data that organizations collect, that businesses collect, that constantly collect, and sometimes in real time, uh, but they can't actually see it in real time. And they can't, uh, they, they can't hire enough people to go through that data to understand that something's happening and impacting the business now. Uh, but machine learning has that capability. Machine learning algorithms can go through vast amount of data very quickly. If they're built build and designed correctly, they can be very accurate, you know, sometimes more accurate than humans. And uh, they can highlight what's important and what's happening right now in real time. So businesses become a lot more proactive about uh, handling issues. And monitoring um, this monitoring space, a lot of companies uh, throughout I would say the last 20 years, there's been all sorts of attempts of trying to automate it, make it more efficient, faster. Uh, But as machine learning grows in the last uh, 10 years, I would say, uh, its role in monitoring has become more and more important. And this is really what we designed in Anadot, uh, to make monitoring autonomous, just like you expect a car at some point to drive by itself. You want your monitoring system to monitor everything about the business by itself and tell you whenever there's something worthy of your attention. 
Great. Thank you so much um, uh, for telling us about Anadot and its specialization. And uh, um, yes, it's becoming really important uh, day by day. And it, it's 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 very interesting to see how you're helping companies be proactive to handle different issues using data and monitoring uh, as well. Now, data science can add value to any business uh, who can use the data well from statistics and insights across workflows and hiring new candidates to helping senior staff make better informed decisions. Data science is valuable to any company in any industry. Now, having said that, um, how would you um, uh, uh, look yourself or what would be your proactive role and your contribution towards Anadot and the industry overall? Yeah, so when I think about Anadot, as, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the vision of the company is to make monitoring autonomous. Uh, so we put the, the machine learning, the data science as, I would say, the, the heart and soul of the product. So obviously the contribution of the data science team to the product are, and to the success of the company, in our case, is quite significant because we are a machine learning company. Uh, basically, the product that we build is without the machine learning, there is no there is no product. Uh, so the contributions that we've made for for the company obviously are very very central. But when I, when I think about the industry as a whole, um, we are one of the first companies that has put the machine learning, the business, the machine learning as a central part of how you monitor. So how do you actually do that? You do that with algorithms that look at specific types of data out there. So machine learning is big, can look at images, text, uh, uh, tables, numbers, uh, so many different types of data out there. In mo when you're talking about monitoring, you're actually monitoring the monitoring the, the, when you're doing monitoring, you're looking at a narrower scope of data, uh, which is time series. Uh, and uh, the contributions that we made to the industry um, as a whole uh, are with the types of algorithms that we use and developed in-house for doing time series analysis for the purposes of monitoring. Uh, and, you know, that's a specialization that we we had to uh, work I had it before, but we had to hire the people that are specialized in that uh, and can develop new algorithms for that because there are significant, there were significant challenges that we had to overcome from the from the actual algorithm perspective. Uh, just to give you a few, one challenge that we had was uh, being able to run algorithms at scale. There have been a lot of research around time series analysis uh, throughout the last, the last few decades, decades, and certainly in machine learning uh, in the last two or three decades. Uh, but they were geared towards data that was not very big. Uh, but now when you're going to analyze huge amounts of time series uh, data, uh, it becomes a different ballgame. If you want to do it at scale, you have to be very efficient, very fast. The algorithms have to be very fast and maintain high accuracy at the same time. And that is one of the challenges that we had to overcome. When, and we took a lot of known algorithms and made them you know, 10,000 times more efficient so we can run them at, at the scale that we do run uh, our, our product. And that's just one example. There are many of those types of examples. And I would say those are the contributions that, I, that, that we provided as a machine learning company to, to the industry. Uh, and of course, as the product itself, I think we are pushing uh, the industry towards the autonomous monitoring solutions. Uh, from going from, from understanding that you don't have to do things manually, you don't have to analyze your data in a manual fashion. You can let those algorithms run through all that data uh, and highlight the insights automatically. Uh, and of course, we're doing it for our you know, corner of the world, which is the monitoring the time series analysis space. Well, definitely, uh, you rightly said that yes, without machine learning, there is no product. And yes, as in uh, as in when we are uh, advancing with technology, we are seeing new forms of automation, and which is penetrating in every industry. Um, so yes, of course, we also need to shift from doing manual tasks and physical tasks, and shift to something autonomous. And yes, monitoring can also be autonomous. Very rightly said. Now, yes. utilizing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, utilizing different sources of big data, like you know, machine learning models, uh, could be trained to quantify a person's clinical risk of developing severe disease if they contract a serious infection such as a COVID nineteen. So, which is a likelihood that they would require specialized care for which the assets are limited. How likely are they are they likely to be uh, infected with the illness? Such data could incorporate people's fundamental medical histories. Now, since uh, we have been uh, witnessing COVID nineteen across the globe, and uh, we have also witnessed the growth of technology during this unprecedented time, how do you think uh, data scientists played an important role during COVID nineteen, and what will be their role in the post COVID nineteen world? So, if we're talking about uh, actual, so actual COVID nineteen uh, uh, work, so working on helping with healthcare and infections, um, I think there are two two roles. The first role, I mean, we've seen throughout this pandemic, I think, more clearly than we've seen than I remember how important data is on decision making. Uh, in the face of a pandemic, and actually, how important it is in healthcare in general. Uh, I wasn't aware. I never worked on healthcare before uh, COVID. I, I'm still not. I can't say that as part of my job. I work on healthcare, but I've been analyzing a lot of data on my spare time related to COVID, and uh, and reading articles, reading uh, medical articles. I think it's very clear that uh, uh, that. To move forward in in decision making for healthcare, um, incorporating data in a much, uh, I would say, systematic and scientific way is is quite important. I think both from the actual treatment point of view, it can help make better treatments, but also from from a societal point of view in terms of uh, creating trust in what experts are recommending. If if we see something throughout this pandemic is the is the erosion of trust in science, mm-hmm. and and I think doing data analysis in a systematic and good way using good data scientists can actually bring back that back that trust because if you can show the data that supports arguments and you can be very honest about you know, what the data shows, what's the confidence intervals in that in that. Uh, so in that thing is that you're saying, if you're saying that, you know, what does it mean to have a 95 percent uh, 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 efficacy of a, va- of a vaccine uh, and, and back it up with numbers and data and explain why this is good science through data science? Uh, I think it can bring back also a lot of the erosion that we, we've seen throughout this COVID-19 in, in trust in sciences. So I would say those are the two roles. First, the actual data science itself. I think biologists, healthcare physicians can benefit from having data scientists next to them, telling them how to analyze data well and correctly, uh, and uh, bring back the trust uh, to some people that have lost it because of all the confusion around COVID-19 that has been out there in the world. Well, definitely. I think you highlighted a really important point that it is not just about having data and doing data analytics, but how we can incorporate data in a very systematic and scientific way is very important. And of course, when you're talking about healthcare, this this role really plays an important, um, uh, a crucial part of the industry, as we are yet to see a lot of new developments in the healthcare um, industry. And would say that this is one of the most um, uh, sensitive and a crucial industry because uh, the entire, the overall society is involved. So yes, definitely, it plays a really important role. Mm, um, moving ahead, um, Ira, most organizations are now asking themselves very challenging questions. One that will change the data analytics strategies for years to come. So who should have permission to access specific data and for what purpose? Does our workforce have the requisite skill sets and mindsets needed to work effectively with data? What technologies do we need to adopt for data optimization and utility? Or how can we effectively execute change management and best leverage our workforce to ensure a smooth transition to new ways of operating that enable short-term and long-term success? In essence, the, all these questions wrap up in how can organization become truly data-driven? Now, can you tell us how um, Anadot is contributing in the artificial intelligence industry and how the company is benefiting its clients? Yeah, so uh, I think... W- 
the main contribution that I see kind of to the overall artificial intelligence industry uh, that I see Anadoc providing is showing that uh, a, a machine learning based or AI based product is the right way of doing things uh, and and uh, and not just providing platforms for people to play for data scientists to play with but actually saying okay we have a problem in our case uh, making monitoring more autonomous let's make a clo a, a, a full product that has all the capabilities of a product as people are used to having products that is you know where the machine learning is the, the center of it the heart of it but it's still a product you don't have to go and it's it's not a project it's not a science project that now you start playing with it to see whether it works or doesn't work but rather you're getting a closed product that does uh, what it's supposed to do what it's promising to do uh, in our case that's this autonomous monitoring uh, uh, promise and is able to do it really with machine learning as the heart or the brain, I would say, and, and have, you know, but it's of, of course complemented with UI and user experience, UX, to make it actually accessible to, to people that are not data scientists. And I think if anything, the way I see our contribution to the artificial intelligence industry is in here is a product and here is the path to reach to a product that is based really solely on machine learning. It's not a feature in, a pro in another product. It's not a new capability that comes with something else, but rather the capability is the AI. And now and this is the path to creating a product that has AI as its central capability within it. Uh, and that's how I see our, our, uh, our contribution um, as showing this example, uh, basically showing th this example. And there are other examples out there that are of companies that are doing it where uh, machine learning is the center, is the, is the product, but it's wrapped in a way that's usable by anybody and not just data scientists and experts in data science. Quite interesting, Ira. I think uh, our listeners are, are going uh, to uh, jump onto Anadot websites and check out more about it. Um, you know, since we're talking about um, data scientists and um, the role in in the COVID and the post-COVID world, I would like to jump uh, to to another question directly. Is that um, how? What are the three most uh, important things, according to you, chief data scientists must do at their organization over the next six months as we come out of the virus and manage a recession? So, again, it, it kind of uh, depends on the organization. But let's let, let's take a chief data scientist in a large enterprise uh, that does a lot of things, uh, and and there is an agenda to add AI to various parts of of the organization whether it's for internal tooling uh, like monitoring for example uh, which is usually internal or for the products themselves so if i if i think about those type of chief data scientists um, the things that uh, that i think uh, they have to think about and be very critical of the of themselves and the organization and how they work is look at all the breadth of projects ai related projects that have been, been put to the table in their company uh, and think uh, very critically about you know which ones are really important uh, for the future of the company uh, which ones are will, will improve the efficiencies within the company uh, and which ones are uh, nice to have and once they do that, they can actually start looking for, uh, basically recommending to to the leaders in the company, you know, the ones that the, the items on the table that are critical to the future of the company, whether it's internal or something that the company intends to sell. Those things should be strengthened by hiring the right data scientists for those, uh, uh, the right developers, and the right you know, move them from just being projects and, and kind of experimentations to creating true products around them. The ones that are uh, made for improving efficiency for internal reasons, they should look carefully at what's out there and try to, you know, buy the best of breed, not try to develop everything in-house. Uh, and the ones that are nice to have, you know, either bench them or, or have some experimentations around them, but 
put them in their place in terms of the resources required to hire them, to, to, to actually materialize them. Uh, so that, to me, that's what a chief data scientist within an organization needs to do because it's very hard for leaders that are not in the data science to really know what is the right approach? Should we? Is this something that is reasonable for us to build ourselves? Is this something that we should buy from other companies as a product? Because all of these projects tend to have, you know, a lot of uncertainty around them. A lot of them are new, so maybe you know, it's not, it's not very clear who is the market leader that I can buy from. Uh, so it is the role of the chief data scientist to go through these projects and make those recommendations in a in a true and honest way that will not cause waste to the organization because we are going out of a you know recession and uh, you you shouldn't just waste resources even if it's not a recession I don't believe that that any company should waste resources on things that they don't have to do. Definitely. I think um, I very much agree with the point that it's really important to find the right approach. Um, do organizations have the resources to build their own tools or they should outsource it or lease it or they should work in with partnership where some of the things are built in-house and some of them are outsourced from third party suppliers? Definitely. And I think um, it's a very crucial factor that you mentioned that, you know, wastage of resources is not what we want, not in times of just recession, but um, in, in general times as well. Yeah, and and projects in the in data science tend to tend to take a long time. They they are not like regular software development where you say, oh, I want to build X and just hire the people enough people to build X. When you're starting a, um, a data science project, I would call it, or uh, you you don't know when you start whether you can achieve the results that you think you can achieve because it's it's data science it's driven by data and until you don't until you run those experiments and do all the work and collect the right data you don't know if it will succeed so making the right decisions is you know it's not just it, it it's more than just a product that, that you can deterministically think about and then make sure it will work it might not work there is risk involved uh, so making those decisions based on realistic views of the resources that you'll have available how much you're willing to spend on a project or a problem that you're trying to solve with it uh, is really important and uh, and this is the role of the chief data scientist because he knows or she knows the you know what they should know how long it will take, what are the risks involved in every project, and whether it's worth you know, spending the effort or not uh, to solve it in-house, partner, as you said, uh, uh, you know, do all these uh, other, uh, other ways of doing things uh, for every particular problem. Definitely, definitely. I think um, when you're talking about decisions, a lot of uh, things come into picture. And um, since we're talking about that, um, I believe data scientists do need to have certain skills when it comes to making decisions or um, using data, AI and machine learning uh, while, they, while they're making projects or doing projects. So um, to keep themselves relevant, it would be critical for young data scientists to continuously upskill themselves with appropriate skill sets that would make them significant enough. To support these immature data scientists, many tech companies have launched their free as well as paid basic and advanced analytics and data science courses that will help them sustain in this uncertain time. When we're talking about upskilling, uh, what do you think are the must-have technologies that a chief data scientist should have at its disposal? Um, yeah, it's a very broad question. I think that uh, the uh, I, I can't point to like a name of a technology because they keep changing all the time. And of course, it also depends on the type of uh, data that you're using. Uh, what I do strongly believe you do need to have something around, uh, I would call it a data lake or a, a system that helps you break the silos of data between different parts of the organization. Uh, so it could be a data lake, it could be a different type of solution, but data lakes have been great at having a central location where data can flow from lots of different parts of the organization. Because at the end of the day, anything around data science is data driven. Uh, data is the fuel. So uh, you, you should at least have all the fuel in one place where you can draw from it. 
That's not enough. Uh, data lakes are great. You have to have also the, the an easy capability of, of getting data out of the data lake for a particular project or product that you're working on uh, and make it easy. Uh, so uh, technologies that help actually extract an efficient way uh, data from these data lakes and create features and uh, allow the experimentation that the data scientists need in order to you know, fuel their projects to have good answers that would be really critical as well um, and then comes the tooling for the data scientists themselves the tooling in terms of algorithms and uh, and uh, platforms where they can run all sorts of experiments uh, here here, you, you just need a platform. Uh, and uh, here, I don't have a good recommendation as to what is the right platform to use. Should you use one platform or should every group uh, take, you know, the best of breed that they can find out there? Uh, it really kind of depends on the complexity of the different types of data that the organization collects. There are very good things for images. There are other good things for text. There are other good things for time series. Um, and analysis so there isn't like a platform out there that is universal yet uh, I think it will come at some point from multiple companies vendors or open source um, so for the you know for the platforms that the, your data scientists are using I think what is important to think about is having the capability to have I would say the uh, um, a way to store all the results. You know, when I when I started as a machine learning, uh, uh, I would call it developer researcher. Uh, you know, all my work was stored on my computer. All the experiments that I did were stored on my laptop. And yeah, yeah, it was up to me to make sure that you know I have the lineage of the things that I've done uh, stored. And, uh, and it's hard now as teams grow bigger, they have to collaborate. Having a central technology that can let you easily store all your experiments, go back to them, see what data it was it ran on, basically have the ability to go back and forth and understand what people did uh, throughout a team or groups of teams, that probably is also critical to have at the disposal of the data science teams and of course the chief data scientist. Because if, if, a, if a team now runs a project, let's say they want to do um, they, they run a project for for solving, let's say, creating models for churn prediction of of of, uh, of uh, clients, and if they can't show the lineage of their work and how they achieve their final model that may be used, then improving things over time would be very hard. If everything's in a mess, it will be very hard. So having some technology that actually lets you understand what the data science teams did over time and how they improved things so they can go back and do all sorts of testing and understand it better. The, the data scientists, the chief data scientist needs it in order to gain confidence in what the teams did. That's so, so data lake, a very good data pipelining uh, to get data out of the data lakes fast and at scale. And then the, I would say, something within your platform that lets you store all these experiments and results so you can understand what has been done in a better way. Well, to be honest, um, I, I actually expected that somehow Data Lake would definitely be one of uh, the most technologies that um, a chief data scientist should have access to because it, it's so important to break the data silos and a unified storage place where you can access data. Otherwise, storage of data and accessing data is itself a challenge. And yeah. then uh, harnessing insights out of that would, would, would become more challenging. So that's definitely true, um, Ira. Mm. Yeah, so um, a data lake by itself is not good enough because it's just a dump. It's definitely. Lake, right? You need, you yeah, need, yeah, then definitely. you need, then you need the boats that take water out of the lake so you can, yeah, and then you need yeah. the lab and then you need to, the, the, the storing of the results of the lab. So, so you, you need it all right. uh, if you want yes. to have solid work done. Definitely, definitely. Now, um, since, you know, we, we, we spoke about all uh, the technologies that we need. And uh, so in, in this time, like especially when you talk, talk about the COVID time, um, uh, what we witnessed was that um, 
certain uh, chief data scientists were were probably demoralized or um, were not happy with the current situations. But instead of seeing themselves as diminished and uh, marginalized by an increase in data-informed users in the midst, um, a data scientists should see their roles as expanding. So they need to recognize that they're becoming catalyzers and galvanizers, marshalling great value for the companies by leading their data literacy charge. And not just them, but all workers at any organization should feel the data enablement is an upward inflection point in their careers, with everyone enriching their careers and helping their companies thrive. So uh, with, with, with such um, uh, changes in the roles and changes in the situations and environment, how do you see um, the role of a chief data scientist evolve in the next five years? Yeah, I think it will be the chief data scientist will be the trusted advisor uh, to all things that relate to data analysis um, and a trusted advisor in the sense of, uh, well, it, two parts, I would say. First, a trusted advisor that can, you know, make, uh, help make decisions about what's feasible, what's not feasible, what's important it's not important how long do you think a project will take and, and you know how it should play out um and what so that's on one hand and of course i think that would be a second part of it uh, as a data as a chief data scientist gets involved more and more in the strategy of a company they will actually start creating the not just give advice about what can what is possible and not possible, but actually push for uh, new data capabilities uh, or new data science capabilities within a company. Um, I, you know, I can tell it from my from my personal story. Uh, so I, I after I graduated my PhD, I worked as a researcher uh, in a research lab, and and after a few years, I actually moved to a product division. Uh, software product division in the company that I worked for uh, as a chief data scientist. Now, nobody knew what a chief data scientist was. I even didn't know what it was. Uh, but uh, that was a title that was, uh, you know, starting to bounce out there that could describe what machine learning experts can do in a, within a company. Now, I saw my role as... Um, Pushing, and, and this is how I defined it to my to my manager, as pushing cap machine learning capabilities, data analysis capabilities to the different product software products that th the company was making, um, and that's how that's how I view my role. And part of my role was first to have a team that worked on algorithms and help uh, helped product teams basically develop these algorithms. And a second part of my role was to actually, uh, the way the way uh, I defined it was to actually teach data science to developers and technologists in the company. So at the time, we actually created courses, internal courses, uh, my team, and we, every quarter, we got together something like 20 to 40 uh, employees of the company throughout the world. And we taught them for a week, what is my Machine learning, what is data science, and, uh, and let them experience it as well. So I think this is this is the way I see the chief data scientist play out and evolve in the next few years. Help teach the organization uh, about machine learning and data science and how to use it. So it's not just the data scientists that are doing it, because there there will never be enough of them of us. And also uh, uh, push agendas that are related to data science that will help the company, uh, and of course be the advisor. Today, there it's it's still mostly the advice, uh, and I think this is where it's going to change quite rapidly, actually. Well, first of all, thank you uh, so much for sharing a personal story. And I'm sure um, our listeners who are crazy data lovers would somewhere relate with you and will make sure that um, how they can evolve in this time and make sure they're helping their companies thrive and become a data-driven company altogether. Now, um, you know, one last question, and that would be, what would be your advice for aspiring data scientists? Um that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, first of all, um, 
the thing for an aspiring data scientist to, to, to see what, so, so a data scientist is not just one thing. There, there are lots of different types, I would say, of data scientists. And the way I like to think about it is, you know, if I had to split it into two or three buckets, I would split it into the data scientists that like to do research. Or try, and, and to do research means they they are happy with the non-determinism that comes with uh, experimenting with something that has a high likelihood of failure, uh, and and keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until it succeeds or doesn't succeed. But be very mindful that you know they can work on a problem and it could fail, and the, and, and on the first try it will a hundred percent fail. On a second try, maybe it will succeed, but you know they're willing to do the work of research and and play around with things and not be um, uh, disheartened when things do not work at all. Uh, because you know the the data scientist that develops a new algorithm tries uh, to solve a new problem. As I mentioned, the non-determinism is great, and it can fail, and it will fail. A hundred times until it succeeds, uh, and and you know, a data an aspiring data scientist has to think of the, uh, to think am, am I am I a good fit for that? Is my personality, is the way I think about things, good fit for that, or do I expect more determinism? And you know, when I look at developers, software developers, some are like that, some are not like that, and and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you're better or worse than others just means that you are more risk averse or less risk averse. Uh, so this is the half of the data scientist, I would say the bucket of the researcher. Um, but in data science, there are other types of data scientists. There are the data scientists that work a lot on uh, the data pipelines and creating the transformations on the data that feed other algorithms down the pipeline. And that is a critical, critical role, uh, I think, no researcher can do well without good data that comes into that research. And um, and I think there is, uh, I don't know what will be the proportions, but probably most data scientists will fall into the bucket of, uh, of the, I would call it the specializations in, in the data um, manipulation and, uh, and bringing it to the table so it can be used. Um, and the third part are the, I would call them the data scientist engineers, the people that I think are interested in kind of building the architecture of the system or data science architects, thinking about the architecture of, of a data science related product and how it would work. Uh, and, and that is kind of akin to a little bit to software architects, except now you have you're not just thinking about the software you're thinking about you know that the whole data flow throughout a system uh going in and out of different parts transformations algorithms outputs to another product so these are the three buckets and i think any data aspiring data scientist has to think you know what do they like more and and if they don't know try it out try a research project see if they like that way of working try the data the data pipeline type of work and try the architecture part of work uh, and of course you can move around so but the first thing to think about is where do you feel yourself fitting the most well this is a true message that will carry the day into tomorrow definitely we can become more in times of crisis and challenge by transiting existing ways of doing things, evolving past practices and looking outside the boundaries of convention. As much as we may initially think of COVID and the post-COVID world as a time of contraction and retrenchment, it can also be a time for redefinition and growth. For organizations everywhere, from fledging startups to century-old multi-billion dollar international corporations, the moment to brace new data science and automation model is now. Well, thank you so much, Ira, for taking out time and um, for being on a podcast. It was quite insightful. I'm sure our listeners are going to love it. Um, uh, it was a pleasure having you with us, Ira. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Thank you.